Jesus City. My name is Jason. I'm the pastor of Jesus City here in Montgomery, Alabama, and I want to welcome you to church. Hey, today we're going to get into God's Word, and I hope you're, you're ready to be encouraged. Today, the, the title of the message is this, Risk is Right. Risk, it's right. You see, it, it seems like we live in a day and age where people are, are more and more apt to take risks in their life. You know, there are these adrenaline junkies, people that live on the edge. They, they have this desire to live in a, is a hazardous way. You know, if it says, do not enter, they're rushing into it. And I was even just looking at some of the like most common things right now that these adrenaline junkies are doing to kind of push the limits, you know, to get the blood pumping and the heart beating. And here's like a, a list of them that I found. And I just thought, man, there, there is no way. Like these people are, they're crazy. You know, some of the things that they're doing is one, they're, they're swimming with sharks. Two, they're going skydiving. And now I actually did this, you know, for my older brother's 40th birthday a few years ago. He was like, hey, we got to go, you know, skydiving for my birthday. And I'm like, dude, there is no way I'm going skydiving. But my older brother and my little brother were doing it. And so they peer pressured me into it. And I will never do it again. Okay, for those of you that enjoy jumping out of a perfectly good airplane, um, you're nuts. Uh, I did it. And I will never do it again. There is no way. I mean, I prayed like I've never prayed before. You know, I was sitting there. It wasn't even like the, the free fall that scared me. It was literally just dangling by this stinking bed sheet, it seemed. <laughs> like, Lord, I was clinging onto that thing so tight. But it's like, okay, like there, there are people that enjoy this, all right? They're, they're adventuring, pushing the limits as far as you can go. Another one, bungee jumping. There ain't no way. Uh, cliff diving, okay? Ice climbing, canyoning, which is another one, storm chasing, base jumping. So this is like jumping off of a cliff. You've got only a few feet. You got to pull that rib cord. Like, come on, like this is nuts. Um, ice swimming. No. Big wave surfing. No. Cliff rock climbing, often without harnesses. You're just nuts. That's all you are. You're nuts. All right. Like there's, there's a fine line between, you know, like I'm, I'm wanting to get the next like adrenaline high to like, you're, you're completely nuts. All right. Like you've lost all sanity. You're nuts. Uh, here's one. It's called cliff camping. They'll climb the side of a cliff. Okay. And then they'll suspend themselves with like a little mattress and they'll sleep out over the open cliff. <laughs> Like, what is wrong with these people? This is craziness. Crazy. Last one, wild survival expeditions. So these are where, you know, these guys that are watching all of these like, you know, naturalist shows and they're like, oh yeah, I'm a, you know, survival expert. And they just go wandering out in the middle of the wilderness, the wandering out in the middle of the desert, and they just try to survive for however many given days. You know, like th these are the adrenaline junkies pushing the limits. And I, I think this, this is what I think about that, you know, is we live in a day and age that they want to experience this next high, as I've been saying. They want to they see how far they can go. And my question is like, why are they doing that? What is the reason why uh, they, they, they desire something so much more and they're willing to have a high risk for such a, a low reward? I mean, think about it. It's a temporary reward. Like you, you go swimming with the sharks one time, then all of a sudden you're like, you know what, now I want to get outside of the cage and, and I want to go hug a shark and kiss a shark, you know? And uh, it, it's high risk, low reward, pushing the limits. And then finally you, you read of these people that are, you know, ended up losing their own life in the process of doing this. But what's the reason? What's the, the urge on the inside to do this? And I think it's this is that God put within every single one of us a desire for more. Even the non-believer senses it and urges it that the commonplace life is insufficient. But what they don't know is this, when you come into faith with Jesus Christ, when you become a believer, what you do is that you join the ranks of some of the greatest people throughout history who have lived the most risky, the most hazardous, the most on the edge type adventurous lives that the world has ever seen.
You know, it, it's, it's sad because we, it seems like we have to look back in history to find these types of lives. It seems like today Christianity has lost its teeth. You know, like most Christians today, they're okay with going to church on the weekends, okay with a little bit of fellowship, a little bit of coffee. Okay, that's Christianity. But it's, like, it's, it's sad because when you look at history, you know, we see something so much more. We see something so much more robust and, and great and stand out and, and names that, that just echo throughout eternity. I mean, think about it. When you become a believer, you join the ranks of people like Moses. Moses, who went in front of Pharaoh, okay, the leader of the known world, and he rebuked him to his face. Moses, who was at the, the edge of the Red Sea and raised his staff against nature itself in, in defiance against this gigantic sea and the God of all creation answering. You, you join the ranks of people like Gideon. Gideon, who had 300 soldiers against 185,000 soldiers. You join the ranks of a young boy named David who stood up against a, a giant. All Israel was scared of the giant, but David with great courage. David with great charisma and, and just something within his bones, great faith in God. He, he goes out and he challenges uh, the giant man. You know, you join the race of Esther. Esther who said, if I die, I die. And she goes in before the king on behalf of her people. And, and she, she succeeds in saving the entire Jewish race. You join the ranks of people like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were told to bow to the iron or to the golden statue, but they did not bow. And it was the, the fiery furnace that they were thrown into. And they went in and God protected them. But courage was there. You've got boldness that was there. You join the ranks of Daniel. Daniel, who said, I will not stop praying. The lion's den, they're a bunch of kitty cats. I'm not worried about it. Daniel did not stop and he was thrown into the, to the lion's den. This is what is amazing to me. The, the richness that exists in Christianity throughout the past that, that should be enough to, to let you know that when you become a believer, there are great things, magnificent things, challenging things right in front of you. But what's happened to the church today is this, is that apathy has set in. Your heart and my heart have become so apathetic to the things of God. Apathetic to the ways that God has moved in times past and the way that God wants to move today. You see, it seems today that there is in the church, there is there's little challenge. There's little calling, there's little courage, there's, there's little cause. And sadly enough, Christians have been lulled to sleep and Christianity has become so commonplace. But what I'm hoping today to show you is this, is that risk is right. God is calling you to live a radical life. God is calling you to put your, 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 your feet to your faith. He's calling you to walk by faith and take great steps of, of courage and you know, walk these, these gigantic roads before the Lord. Listen, those who expect great things from God are often the ones who attempt great things for God. Today, we're looking at a man who exemplified what it means to live a life on the edge, to to hazard his own life for the sake of the gospel. And I'm hoping me and you learn a little bit from this. I'm hoping that you, you walk away from this saying, you know what? I don't care the challenge. I don't care the fear. I don't care the worry. I don't care the obstacle. I don't care the wall. I don't care the enemy. If God be for me, who could be against me? And that's the beauty that we have today. You see, the adrenaline junkies of today, they've got high risk, low reward. But the believer... It's high risk. It's actually a temporary risk, by the way, because it's only your life, not eternity. High temporary risk with high eternal reward. The riskiest thing that you could ever do is be obedient to the will of God. That's the riskiest thing you could ever do. Because what you're going to do is you're going to follow God into the impossible. You're going to follow God into the things that the world would say, that's not possible. But with God, all things are possible. I want to show you a man named Epaphroditus today. You see, we have been looking at the book of Philippians chapter 2, and the entire time Paul the Apostle has been mapping out for us really what the Christian life looks like. Namely, it's about sacrifice. 
Chapter 2 of Philippians starts out with the, the ideal sacrifice, and that is Christ. Jesus Christ, who stepped out of heaven, came to earth and laid down his life for me and you. He humbled himself to the point of death, even death of a cross, and then he rose again from the dead. Jesus models for us what the Christian life is. It's us often dying sacrificing, you know, taking these gigantic steps for his honor and his name. And so we see Jesus at the beginning of Philippians chapter 2. Jesus. And it says this in Philippians 2, 5, have this mindset in you, which was also in Christ. So Jesus Christ had this mindset is that I'm going to step out and sacrifice to attain something great. And then we find ourselves looking at the Apostle Paul. Just a little bit further in Philippians chapter 2, we find Paul, if you remember a few weeks ago, where Paul said, look, if I am being poured out as a living sacrifice on the service of your faith, he says, I count it as great joy. So we see Jesus sacrificing. Now we see Paul, the apostle, living a radical life of sacrifice where he was saying, look, I'm willing to go to prison. I'm willing to take shipwreck and, and beatings with a rod and fastings and hunger. I'm willing to do whatever it takes so that you will come into contact with Jesus so that you would experience Christ. Paul joyfully sacrificed something he loved for something he loved even more. Paul's like, look, I, I don't care what's going to happen to me as long as you get to where you're supposed to be. I want you, Philippians, I want you to encounter Christ and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get you there. So we see the sacrifice of Jesus. We see the sacrifice of Paul. Then last week, we saw the sacrifice of Timothy. Timothy was a young man. He was kind of Paul's Padawan. He was there with Paul three different times in the city of Philippi alone. Timothy got to see sacrifice. Timothy got to see hardship. Timothy, no doubt, got to experience riots and maybe probably a few beatings and probably a few nights of hunger and sleeplessness. Like, Timothy got to experience that. And then even here in our letter last week, we got to see where Timothy, what he sacrificed was he was willing to go where Paul was at from Rome all the way back to Philippi just to check in on these believers, which was about 800 miles, a six-week journey. Timothy's like, you know what? I'm going to go. Timothy was willing to sacrifice. Timothy was willing to put his life on, on the edge for the sake of the gospel. So we've got Jesus. We've got Paul, who was the Hebrew of Hebrews. We've got Timothy, who was like a half-breed. He's like half-Jew, half-Gentile. Now we're at the end of Philippians chapter 2, and what we're seeing is another man that Paul is highlighting, someone who lived radical for Christ, someone who was not afraid to step into harm's way for the advancement of the gospel, someone who cared more for the glory of Christ than for the comfort and the ease in his own life. And his name is Epaphroditus. Paul says about this guy some very interesting things. And it's there in Philippians chapter 2 that we find out about him. But what I want to point out is the very last verse in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, this is what Paul says about Epaphroditus. And it's really the theme of today's message. And it's about risk. It's about hazarding your life for the sake of the gospel. Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 29 and 30. It says... Receive him, Epaphroditus, therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service to me. Verse 30, he says that this man, Epaphroditus, he came close to death, and he said, not regarding his life. Maybe your translation says risking his life, but in the, in the original, in the Greek, it literally means hazarding his life for the sake of Christ. We've got a man who said, I don't necessarily care about what happens to me because I see such a great need ahead of me. Here's the principle I want to share with you today. The reason why the church... You and me, people within the pews. The reason why we don't take more risk for the kingdom of God is because we have little vision for the need that's ahead of us. You see, when we have big vision for the need that's calling out for us, we will then take the adequate risk, or at least we should take the adequate risk. We should walk by faith and, and go into the, the waters that seem higher than our head and go into the fires that seem hotter than we can bear, go into the places where the enemy is occupying, and, and we, we would charge ahead if we but had the vision to see. What I'm going to show you right now is a man named Epaphroditus who had great vision to come alongside Paul. 
And he said, you know what? There's a great need. Epaphroditus felt that need. He had vision for that need. Therefore, he took the risk and he was willing to sacrifice his life for the sake of service to God and service to Paul. I pray your heart gets ready. Please listen to me today. Would you be open and available to say yes to God? Risk is right in your life. We are called to live risky lives for the kingdom of God. People have done it before us and people are going to do it after us. Would you join the ranks and would you say yes to the Lord? Obedience to the Lord is the riskiest path that you could ever be on. Look what Epaphroditus to be, you know, did to, in, in his obedience to the Lord. Uh, and look what risk was given here. It says in verse 25, he said this, Yet I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my fellow brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. Since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick, almost unto death, but God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him more eagerly, eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service to me. Paul was in prison. Paul had great needs before him. The Philippians heard that Paul was in prison and the Philippians actually wanted to go and bless Paul, but they couldn't. As I mentioned, from Rome all the way to Philippi was an 800 mile journey, it took six weeks to get there. This isn't like hop in your car and you can get there in a few hours, but this is like a, a real like horseback long journey. You know, it's gonna take some sacrifice. So the Philippians found out that Paul was in prison and things were desperate. He needed some supplies. And so the Philippian church, they loved Paul so much. They said, you know what? We heard about him. We know what's going on. We want to send him money. We want to send him supplies. And it was Epaphroditus that said, I want to take it. I want to be the one that travels there to minister to Paul. And so Epaphroditus said yes to the opportunity. What Epaphroditus didn't realize was that along the way, he was going to encounter something that brought him on the very brink of death. And it was a sickness. You see, the Christian life is not just ease and comfort and safety, but there's a sense of wrestling and work and warfare and wounds that really happen in the Christian life. Where Epaphroditus actually got sick. He was saying yes to the Lord. I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to go. I'm going to serve Paul. But along the way, he encountered something difficult. He got sick. And in the course of that, he arrives in Rome. And instead of just ministering to Paul, now Paul nurses the guy back to health. Okay. He still delivers the package to Paul. So Paul still kind of gets the money. He gets the supplies. It was a great blessing what had happened. And now Paul's going to send Epaphroditus back. And the letter that you're holding in your hand, by the way, uh, if you're holding the book of Philippians, was carried by Epaphroditus. And so Epaphroditus carried it from Rome all the way back to Philippi, this very thing that we're reading right now. But the man Epaphroditus, you know, what he said yes to is, is very interesting. You know, he said yes to an opportunity uh, to serve God with great hazard right before him. You see, the road that he walked on was not one of just complete safety and, and ease and comfort, you know, but, but there were challenges along the way. And, and this is a reminder for me, you know, like the Christian life, it's, it's not a bed of roses. It's not. You know, when you join the ranks, you're saying yes to real work. You're saying yes to real warfare. That's, it's, that means there's the real enemy out there who's really trying to take you out. You know, like you've got an enemy who hates you and, and wants to tear you down and ruin your witness and drag you to hell if possible. He'll do anything and everything, you know, to get you discouraged and downtrodden. And, and you're, you're saying yes to that, by the way. That's what's crazy about the Christian life. You know, is that we look at Epaphroditus and we go, man, like he actually got sick. But that's not new. I don't know why in the Christian church right now there's a trend where we think like, 
you know, the Christian life is, is great and it's all sunshine and it's all flowers and, and, it's, and it's beautiful because it's not always that way. There are times that it's a storm cloud ahead and the darkness does not lift. I mean, think about the different trials that people have gone through in order for the furtherance of the gospel or for the advancement um, of the church. I mean, just think about like, okay, Paul the Apostle. Paul was put in prison. Paul was shipwrecked. Paul was beaten. Paul had a thorn in the flesh that he, he was pleading with God three times. God, would you take it back from take it away from me. And, and it was Jesus that said, look, my grace is sufficient for you in your weakness. You know, I will be made, you will be made strong. Like God was going to provide for him strength in his weakness. You think about the apostles. Did you know that all of them died a brutal death except for John? John died, you know, at the, the ripe old age of like in his nineties, um, but they suffered. These are people that, that accomplished much for the kingdom of God, but they, they really went through hardship. And here we've got Epaphroditus who walked a road right before him. He said yes to to a hazardous life. Risk is right in your life. I don't want you to shy away from difficult. And I don't want you to think that God is upset at you. If all of a sudden life right now is a little difficult. When you say yes to being obedient to God, if things seem to be a little bit um, harder than normal, just know uh, that, that that's kind of par for the course, that that's, that's to be expected, you know, when you're charging ahead for the Lord. Now, I've learned this, my wife and I being out here in Alabama, you know, it seems like we will take like two steps forward and, and then the enemy will attack. You know, just a few days ago, as an example, like this is what's crazy. Uh, like, you know, the enemy loves to attack me through my family, uh, through my wife, and even my, my health, you know, it seems, which by the way, a lot of godly men throughout history have had like poor health. You know, Satan has a, attacked them or the Lord has, has had his hand, his heavy hand upon them. You know, everybody from like, you know, C.H. Spurgeon who had gout um, and, and severe depression and David Brennard who had severe depression. You think about other people who had severe issues going on in their body like D.L. Moody. And you think about modern people like Johnny Erickson Tato who's um, com- completely paralyzed. And I, I've used some of these before, but just a, this past week as an example, you know, it was a few nights ago that here in Montgomery, uh, my wife woke up in the middle of the, uh, you know, like early in the morning and she looked at some of our cameras on our house and in the middle of the night, you know, someone broke into our backyard, someone went through the fence and someone broke into our garage and uh, they were in there, not sure how much, you know, what they stole, but then they walked all the way up to our backyard and, you know, they're getting ready to break into our house. Praise God, one of my cameras was working and the spotlight popped on and, you know, they got scared away, but still there's this unnerving feeling, you know, my wife, like, are, are we safe? Like, what's going on? Like, what? Like, Lord, are, are you watching out for us? And, and you kind of feel a sense of like just violation. You know, we've had our rocking chair stolen off our front porch and my truck got broken into. And, and now we've got a guy breaking into our backyard. It's like, man, like, what, what did I sign up for? This is crazy. That same day, my crown on my tooth, it popped off. And I'm like, what is this? Then I fell down the stairs. <laughs> no joke. Like I was wearing my, like my normal socks. I just, and so like I bruised my, my tailbone like crazy. It still kind of hurts. You know, I'm like, what's going on? My wife wife's washer machine broke that same day. It's like, what is, what is happening right now? Like the, the enemy is at work. You know, when you charge into the dark, when you do much for the kingdom of God, you have to expect that the enemy is not going to just allow it to happen. You know, you have to expect that there is going to be some type of pushback And here what we see in the text is that Epaphroditus encountered real sickness. Now, whether or not this was was God inflicting him or the enemy coming after him, nonetheless, it was allowed. Like God permitted sickness to take place in Epaphroditus, this faithful, loving, amazing servant. He was allowed to get sick and he hazarded his life for the sake of ministering to Paul. What I want to show you is what Paul says about Epaphroditus. You see, because here are the qualities that exist inside the church for people that are willing to say yes to the, to, to the Lord, to be obedient to the will of God. Here are the things that, that take place. Look at the five compliments that Paul gave to Epaphroditus. And I'm hoping these are the same compliments that someone would give to you. These are the descriptions 
of, of the godly men and women throughout history. The way that they've, they've come alongside and they've done much for the kingdom of God. And that's what I'm praying for the people of Jesus City. That we would have these things said about us. That we would be living on the edge. That we would be risking everything. Hazarding our life for the advancement of the gospel. And these compliments would be given to us. Look at what Paul says there in verse 25. He says, To the Philippians, I considered it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus. First of all, he's my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier, your messenger, and the one who ministered to my need. Five compliments that Paul gave to this godly man who risked it all for something so great. The first thing that we see is this, is Paul said, Epaphroditus is my, my brother, my brother. We need to start being family members to each other in the church. One of the greatest ways that we can encourage each other and prod each other onto loving good works to take big steps of faith is to know that we've got each other's back. You see, family, they stay. That's the first point, is that family, they stay. Family, they're the type of people that say, look, I don't care who goes, I don't care what happens, I'm with you. I've got your back. Epaphroditus said, I've got Paul's back. I'm going to go. I'm going to stand with him. I'm going to be there for him. I'm going to deliver what is needed. I'm going to go the extra mile. I am a brother to Paul. Like blood is thicker than water. Like if we viewed each other as family and I actually said, look, we're called to something so much greater. We're called to do so much more for the Lord. You know, it was even Jimmy Carter that said, go out on a limb because that's where the fruit is. Okay, and that's it. When we're willing to say, look, I'm willing to go and be with you and stand tall for you, stay right where you're at, you know, I think we would be encouraged to take bigger steps of faith. You know, it's a lot easier to do risky things when you've got somebody there encouraging you. And it's, it's a lot easier to live bold for the Lord, I think, when you've got other people who are standing with you. People that are staying by your side. You know, it was amazing that Daniel could say, I'm not going to stop praying all by himself. It's amazing that he was able to accomplish that. It's amazing that Esther was able to, but Esther wasn't alone. Esther had her, her uncle, you know, uh, Mordecai, that was there encouraging her and telling her, this is what you need to do. Along the way, you will see that almost every godly individual has these people behind the scenes that are praying for them and reminding them of what is true. We're being family to each other, saying, look, we're not alone. You're not alone. You're not going through this alone. I'm standing with you. I'm praying for you. I believe this is what you're supposed to be doing. If we would do that for each other, if we would do what Epaphroditus did for Paul and be a family member, Paul's like, dude, this guy was my brother. This was like my bro. You know what I mean? Like Epaphroditus, my man, bro, you stood with me. You were there. Nobody else came, but Epaphroditus came. Love you, bro. Like if, if we did that, if we honestly did that, I believe the church would do so much more for the kingdom of God. It's time that we view each other as, as family. You're my brother. You're my sister. And I've got your back. I'll be praying for you. I'm going to stay by your side. I'm in your corner. Like Let's be those type of believers. The second thing that Paul compliments Epaphroditus with, that I believe, man, if we, if we just had this, he says this, he is my brother, my fellow worker. My fellow worker. Paul said, this guy not only came out because he loved me like a brother, but he came out and he worked for me. He's a fellow worker. Now, Paul's not only meaning just like a fellow worker of the gospel, fellow worker in, in, in the kingdom of God, doing work, but he, he's just noticing that Epaphroditus was willing to sweat. That's the second point. First point is that, you know, family, they stay. Workers, they, they sweat. When you have people that are next to you and they say, look, I'm going to work with you. Not only am I going to stay and stand by you, but I'm going to sweat with you. I'm going to sweat with you and sweat for you. When, you. when you've got people that are willing to put in elbow grease and come alongside and, and say, you know what, I'm going to carry the load. I, I'm going to burden this. I'm, I'm you know, with you. I'm, I'm going to shoulder this pain with you and this, this work, this vision that you have. I'm going to run with you as hard as I possibly can. When you have people that are willing to sweat it out with you, 
work with you for the kingdom of God. You go so much further. There are these horses that are called draft horses. Now, years and years ago, they would use these draft horses uh, to pull out, you know, like logs and large things from forest as they were cutting them down and clearing the way. And these horses are stronger than any other horse. And this is what they found, like a single draft horse can pull like a ridiculous amount of weight. But what they found is that when you pair up two draft horses together, you know, bigger than Clydesdales here, these are gigantic, strong horses. Their strength not only doubles, but it quadruples. I, I really think this, that when me and you come together and say, look, I want to come alongside and work with you for the kingdom of God. When you are willing to put in the sweat work for the Lord with somebody else, what you find is that God blesses your efforts. God increases your strength. God increases the reward. The compliment that he got was that he was... He was willing to sweat. Like, my goodness, we need more Christians that are willing to sweat, willing to put in the hard work, willing to say, look, I'm going to be there. I'm going to do that. I'm going to show up. I'm going to be a part of the work. Like, where would the church be if more of us were willing to sweat, to work? I want it said about you that not only are you a brother that stands and stays, but you are a worker that sweats. Paul's third compliment Epaphroditus. He's like, look, that guy, he came and he stayed with me. That guy came and he sweat for me. But not only that, he's a fellow soldier. He came to storm the gates of hell with me. Soldiers, you know what they do? Is they storm ahead. Think about a war. Can a war be won by one individual alone? Maybe in the movies, okay? Maybe like in a video game, it's like, yeah, I took out like hundreds of them. Or maybe David's mighty men when you read in the Old Testament that they're killing Samson. These are the exceptions. But wars are not generally won with one soldier. You've got an army that takes on an army. You've got individuals that are shoulder to shoulder and shield to shield. And they're taking up arms next to each other. You know, we're going to storm the gates together. Think about if we had the church today where a bunch of Christians were not apathetic, sitting back, you know, waiting for something, but they were, they were leaning in, willing to take ground, saying, I'm going to storm this with you. I'm going to run ahead. Not only am I going to stay by your side, not only am I going to sweat this out, but I'm going to storm these gates with you. You know, I, I genuinely think, I genuinely, pause here. I genuinely think that, that God would do more in our nation if there were believers who were willing to storm ahead together. Instead of just waiting back in the safety, stepping into the dark, pushing back the darkness together. Paul noticed that Epaphroditus was a soldier. He was not afraid of battle. He was not afraid of the enemy. He was not afraid of attack. And that's why he willingly almost sacrificed his entire life. He willingly got sick to go minister to Paul. This is amazing that he would do that. He was a soldier. What a good soldier. It's time to be a good soldier. It's time to storm ahead. It's time to, to link shields and, and move forward together. The fourth compliment that Paul gives. Come on, this is good stuff, okay? The fourth compliment that Paul gives is he says, he is my messenger from you. Also said, he is the one who was the messenger from you or your messenger. This is the word apostolos, where now we've got Epaphroditus not only coming to stay, not only coming, you know, to, to be there to sweat, be there to storm, but now we've got one that's willing to speak. Speak. Epaphroditus carried the message to Paul. He was willing to speak up. Epaphroditus was willing to do what was required of him even if it meant just opening his mouth and delivering a message. Today, I feel like the message of the gospel is not advancing because so many Christians are unwilling to speak up. We're afraid. We, we, do, we don't really care about the commission from the Lord. We're too worried about what the world has to say. Did you know something crazy happened today? Check this out. My, my son and I, we just had you know, uh, 
like a, a little thing. My wife, my son and I went out and on my way back home, there was a car that was next to us, like two lanes over. And without even looking, I was kind of looking at the car, this guy in this car, he completely cut across three lanes and he cut right in front of me. I mean, I was like this close to hitting the guy. And so I swerved really hard, you know, and I went up on this curb and I went in this grass field. I almost hit this tree. And so I'm like, Aah! you know, and I come to a stop and I was just like, oh Lord, my son's like, oh. And, you know, praise God, you know, we didn't hit each other. But I jump out and the guy jumps out. And the first thing out of this guy's mouth, he's like, thank you for paying attention. Thank you for paying attention. He's like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And, and I'm like, immediately in my mind, I'm thinking, I need to tell this guy about Jesus. Like, that was the first thing that popped in my mind. I'm like, listen, it was God that protected us. It was God. He's like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, no, no, no. God protected us back there. I don't know how that's possible. I don't know how I, how I saw you. But man, that was the Lord that was watching out for us. And he's like, oh, man. I said, so praise Jesus. He's like, yeah. I'm like, do you go to church anywhere? He's like, no, man, I'm a Catholic. I don't go to church. I'm like, I want to invite you to come to Jesus City. No, I only go to... I, I only go to mass. I don't, I, you know, I don't, I don't really go to church. I said, listen, the least that you can do for me, since you stinking almost hit me and caused me to run a curve is that you can come to church. And he's like, you're right. That is something I can do. You know? And I'm like, I'm like, listen, you need to get right with the Lord. I'm like, this is, this is too crazy. You know, like God sent you. I'm like, what's your name? He's like, my name is Justin. And I'm like, listen, Justin, God loves you. And, and there's a reason why this whole thing happened right now. And I want to tell you, I'm going to speak into your life. God loves you. God has a plan for your life. And, and I want to pray for you right now. He's like, okay, yeah, okay, sure. And so right there on the side of the road, you know, we bowed his head and I bowed my head and I, I preached the gospel. I pray over this guy. And, you know, and there was a sense of boldness in my heart where I'm just like, I don't care what you think, man. And I don't care what, what's going on in your mind. I don't care what excuse you just gave me. I'm going to tell you, look, if you're going to inconvenience my day, if you're going to try to hit my truck, you're going to like put my life in danger. I'm going to tell you about Jesus, right? Like we need to have a sense where we're like, like, I don't care what you say. I don't care if you say no. I don't care if you tell me I can't. I don't care, you know, what your reaction may be. I'm going to speak up and tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I'm going to tell you about the love of God. I'm going to love you and I'm going to pursue you. Epaphroditus spoke up. If this is what happens today in the church, where all of God's people were not afraid to speak up and, and, and say what is right and true, my goodness, my goodness, we would see just, we would see crazy revival break out. I'm confident of it. You know, the, the gospel is so powerful that it, it doesn't just make, you know, bad people good, but it brings dead people to life. Stony hearts become flesh. You know, if we just speak the gospel, if we just with confidence let people know that God loves them and we got over our fears and our worries and our anxieties and our, our I don't know how to, it's like, get over it. Speak up, take ground, live risky, live hazardous. It's, it's, it, it is scary, but embrace that and say, you know what, you listen to me. I'm gonna stand by your side. I'm gonna sweat this out. I'm gonna storm ahead. I'm going to speak up. Oh man, this is, this is good. This is it. Esteem such a one because they risk their life for Christ. The final thing that Paul compliments Epaphroditus with is he says, I send back to Epaphroditus, my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier, your messenger, and the one who ministered to my need. The word minister there is actually where we get our Greek word uh, for liturgy, okay? Which generally the word liturgy is like a priestly type service. It's a very sacramental type sacred work where you are doing something to the Lord. Paul said, not only did Epaphroditus come to do all of those things, but he came and he ministered to me. He served me. The compliment that you could be given is this. They risked it all to serve, serve in a way that resembles Christ. Epaphroditus traveled 800 miles, six weeks journey, put his life on the line, got sick to the point of death, all for the sake of ministering to Paul. 
Now that might seem like a humdrum theme. That might seem like nothing. You know, I just came to give you some money. I came to give you some supplies, Paul, because we love you so much. I came to minister to you that commonplace thing. But Paul elevates his service to the point of something very sacred where Paul's like, look, I know he came out here to minister to me, but he was actually ministering to the Lord, which is a reminder for me and you that you would be the type that people would say, look, they've done much for the kingdom of God. They've done everything that's required. Not only are they speaking up and standing and, and storming ahead, but they're also now serving. They're not just going after, you know, the, the name and lights and they're getting all of the attention. They're willing to do the nitty gritty, get dirty, serve to advance the kingdom of God. It reminds me, you know, like, when we look at our own life, like, do you serve with this mentality that I'm doing it for God? I, I heard a, a recent, you know, a biography of Ruth Bell Graham. And over Ruth Bell Graham's kitchen, she had this phrase, divine service rendered here three times a day. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter where you work. It doesn't matter the task before you. If you do it for the Lord... If you serve with a heart focused on God, it becomes a divine duty. It becomes a sacred task. It becomes a liturgy to God where you are doing something beautiful, even though it seems mundane, for the glory of God. And it's in those things where, where God does not work on our heart, but he also advances his kingdom. Here are the five compliments that Paul gave to this wonderful man who risked it all for the kingdom of God. Somebody who really lived on the edge. Somebody who really did the right thing. Somebody who, who stands out and being an example for all. He, he stood as a brother. He sweat as a worker. He stormed ahead as a soldier. He spoke up as a messenger and he served. He served. He served as a great example of Christ. Listen to me, you embrace those five things and you will have a life that's lived on the edge. You will have your heart pumping, blood racing. You will find yourself with more adventure ahead of you than any type of shark cage diving, cliff camping, white water rafting, canyoneering, bungee jumping, sky diving. I don't care what the world has it. You will find something more exciting, something more risky, something that'll keep you on the edge of your seat, something that'll catch the eyes of the non-believer, something that'll keep you excited about the next day when you find yourself walking in obedience to the will of God. May God make us obedient to his will. May God call us out of our comfort zones. May God do a great work in and through you, my friend. Listen, we're called to so much more. One day we will get to heaven. And the book of Hebrews chapter 11 talks about all of these people that have gone before us. Hebrews chapter 12 says there's a great cloud of witnesses. What a beautiful thing it will be when we get to heaven and you get to look into the eyes of Moses. You get to look into the eyes of Abraham and David and Gideon and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and Esther. You know, and you get to look into their eyes and say, thank you. Thank you for taking big, bold steps. Thank you for being confident in the Lord. And they will say, well done. You did it too. May we, may, may you and me, may we take big risks for the kingdom of God. God wants to do a work right now in our day and age through you. Would you say yes? Would we be like Isaiah where he says, whom shall I send? Who will go? And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for my friends and I pray God that you would ignite a passion in their hearts. Lord, I'm reminded again of that quote, those who expect great things from God will attempt great things for God. God, we expect great things from you. We know that you still want to work. We know that you still want to move. We know that you still want to change this world and impact lives. God, we expect those things, but now, Lord, we pray that you would use us for those things. Lord, would you help us take steps out of the boat? Do things that are not comfortable. God, would we be the type of believers that stay next to each other and stand for each other? The type that sweat it out and storm ahead. Those that are not afraid to speak up and serve those in need. Lord, put it in our hearts, God. Stir the church. Lord, I pray that you would revive the church in America. But before you revive them, would you revive me? Would you revive those that are listening? God, would you cause an awakening in America that, that the world has never seen? Lord, would you allow your church to wake up from their sleep, that they would cast off the bonds and break the yokes of apathy, and that, Lord, we would 
see you move in our day and age like never before. Lord, we thank you. We pray that your spirit would fall upon us, anoint us for this work. And so, Lord, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for the examples, Lord, all the examples that have gone before us. And Lord, we pray this all for your glory, your advancement, that people would know you. God, you love the world so much that you stepped out of heaven, took a cross, and then rose again from the dead. Jesus, we honor you today. We thank you for the example that you've set before us, for the joy that was set before you. You endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of the Father. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Family, I love you. God bless you. Hey, if you've not subscribed to any of our channels, would you subscribe? Would you help us get the word out? Would you share? Would you let other people know? You know, we, we want to see God do a work, not only in our lives, but there's other people out there that need it as well. But until we meet again next week, God bless you. And I've got a word for you. Listen, there's a God in heaven who loves you.